Hey, you're in the den with Dr. Jen, and I'm here with Dr. Neil Cannon, who's a sex therapist and a licensed marriage and family therapist. And we're talking about BDSM. So let's start first with just a definition so folks know what we're talking about here. Sure. So BDSM, bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism. Okay, and I know you are particularly an expert in this area. You've done research on it. You're known as a national expert. Tell us a little bit about what you've, what you've done around this. Well, we did one big study where we were able to actually take a look at psychopathology among self-identified BDSM practitioners. And what we found was that there's no increased levels of psychopathology between BDSM practitioners huh. and the general population. Wow. We also were able to study intelligence and we found that in the IQ department, BDSM practitioners are 10 standard deviation points <coughs> excuse me, higher in IQ. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. Were you surprised by those findings? Well, I was, I was surprised by the extent or uh -huh. how, just how much higher it was. And if you think about it, BDSM is a really complex game of role play. So it takes intelligence to be able to play in that way, be aroused by some of the fantasies, and communicate with yeah. their partners the way BDSM people tend to do. Very, you know, because they, 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 they communicate really no well. No kidding, yeah. If what? my regular clients, my vanilla clients, <laughs> communicate as well as my BDSM clients, <laughs> I'd be like out of business. <laughs> well, what's, what's the prevalence? What's the prevalence of BDSM? 11% uh, uh, of women and 14% of men in the United States have participated in some form of SM activities. Wow, uh, yeah, that's a lot higher than probably most people would mm -hmm. expect. Well. Why, what are the benefits of somebody in the, uh, who identifies as a BDSM community coming to see professionals like us? Sure. Well, the first thing is if they, they're going to not be judged, right? They're going to be accepted, right? Isn't that like the last place you want to be judged is by your therapist? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just to be able to come in and be in a safe space, that's just like the price of entry. And then there's all the, the, the nuances that go with counseling, whether it's individual counseling or marriage counseling to people that have this as part of their sexual template. So it's kind of, it's half of the battle is creating the safe space where you don't get judged and then otherwise just dealing with whatever concerns have mm -hmm. shown up. What do you think about, you know, because me as a sociologist, I see this as, you know, the, the main problem here is that so the sexual behavior isn't just matching with our normal sexual norms of what we consider okay as a mm -hmm. society. What do you think about that? I, I have this belief that if all roads lead to, to Rome, when it comes to sex therapy, all roads lead to shame, oh. right? Yeah. And so when we kind of can understand that going in around some of these alternative sexual expressions and help people work through the shame, it can be really healing. Absolutely. This is such a valuable perspective mm -hmm. you bring. Thank you, Neil.